we were talking about the Caro pawn structure. And the last time we were talking about the C5 break, right? So we saw a couple of examples of how when black plays the move C5, uh, oftentimes he can get a good game. So what can white do against that? So let's see. Three, c6, e4. So you notice that we had the pawn structure already, but white's pawn's on c4. So knight f6. Check. Queen f6. Knight f3, bishop Check. e4. Bishop e2. Take, take. Knight e7. Castle. Castle. Okay. So Black's tried to trade some minor pieces in order to sort of alleviate the fact that he's a bit more cramped. But it actually really hasn't helped him. So white plays this move, queen e3. Yeah, it is fixed. Why do I castle queenside? Well, because he knows that Black's going to castle kingside, and he wants to put his king away from these pawns because he wants to push these pawns and start a kingside attack if possible. And his king's going to be safe on the queen side. So by keeping his king on the queen side, he can, or yeah, by keeping his king on the queen side, he, he can push these pawns without fear. So black plays this move c5, oops, after queen e3. So the point being white can't really hold on to this pawn after pawn takes queen f5, you know, this pawn's lost now. So bishop d3, queen takes c5, and rook hg1. Okay. So, um, so Black's, like I said, traded a couple of pieces, but it really hasn't helped his position. Because what's What's Black's major problem here? Yeah, this guy is not good. And, and even in an end game, this is a factor. Because if you are lagging in development in an end game, it still matters. So if, uh, yeah, and also because this is not developed, this is also stuck. But so yeah, if black tries to go into an endgame with queen Check. takes, rook takes, knight f6, try to get this bishop out via bishop d7 to c6. Now, of course, white makes the move knight to e5. The idea being hitting this d7 square. And you can't play this move because of why. Um, well, because you just lose a pawn. Knight takes d7, knight takes d7, bishop takes h7, Check. and rook takes d7, and white's winning. Better rook and just up a clear pawn. So, after this knight e5 move, it turns out that it's very difficult for black to get his pieces out. And white has a very nice edge here. Okay, so black decided, okay, I'll try my luck in the middle game and play queen to c7. But now, knight e5, again, same problems, right? So take, 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 take. He still can't play bishop d7 because of his wishes. Bishop takes h7, same thing, wins a pawn. So rook e8. And now king to b1, an important preparatory move. Just getting his king off the c file, so, you know, potential b5 stuff doesn't alarm white. So oftentimes when white castles queenside, he ends up playing this move king to b1. And it looks like a waste of a tempo, but it turns out that it oftentimes helps white in various situations. One is it gets the king off of this diagonal, um, which may be important sometimes. And also, and more importantly in this position, it gets the king off the c-file. Um, so after knight f8, white played this very strong move. Do you guys see what white would play here?
Yeah. That's also a good point, Oni. Very good. Yeah, and also sometimes this pawn comes under attack, so King B1 defends it. That's a good point. Like if the queen were on a5, for example. That actually is an important point. Um, so what does white play here? Well, if you've studied my previous pawn structure uh, videos, or at least my videos on pawns, you guys should notice that the weak point in this position is d6. So the right move is c5. The idea is we just want to transfer this knight to d6 via knight c4 or knight d6. And the knight is a monster on d6. Queen e4 doesn't actually do anything. Looks pretty, but you're not actually threatening anything. Because don't forget, this knight on f8 defends this. But after c4 to c5, f6, knight c4, e5, knight e6, rook e7, f4, exploiting the fact that this rook is pinned because we have two attackers on it. Bishop d7. And now white transformed his monster knight into a king attack. So he played f5, which looks like it just blocks up everything. But it turns out that this g4, g5 pawn thrust is very strong. So bishop c6, check, check. king h8, now g4, g5, and then f takes, queen takes, h6, queen h5, bc, knight f7, check. king h7, knight g5, check. king h8, and then of course, do you guys, do you guys know how to finish it off here? This one's kind of easy. So we're, we, we're almost completely through with bearing the king. We just need one final maneuver. And yeah, secret noob got it, f6. So after f6, g takes f6, queen Check. takes. Knight h7, knight h7, rook h7, queen takes f6, Check. rook g7, and rook takes e5. And black resigned because he's getting made. Simply rook h5 is checkmate and it seems hard to stop so that's one way to do it so notice that white achieved pressure in this game by playing this early d take c5 and exploiting the fact that he had full control of the d file so if white's able to play d take c5 and exert pressure on the d-file more quickly than black can finish developing his forces, then it's a good good thing for white. And notice that by queenside castling, we were able to get the rook to d1 in one move. Um, so what, what was black's problem in this game? Well, black's problem was he was too agreeable to change exchange minor pieces. So let's just go back real fast. And I'll show you what Black could have done instead that would have kind of helped him a bit. Um, okay, so in this position, <clears throat> rather than playing knight f6, he could have played bishop b4 check. check. The idea being if bishop d2, queen takes d4, threatening this. And if knight c3, then this move c5 right away. And then he, you know, can get his knight to c6 in one move, bishop d7, bishop c6, and black is okay here. So, so yeah, if, if white's ready to kind of pounce with the lead in development, d takes c5 will be, will be uh, a potential countermeasure. Let's, let's look at another example of how d takes c5 can help white. So we're going to look at it from a French... Oh, sorry, it's actually going to be Karakon. Knight c3, d4, knight e4, bishop f5, knight g3, bishop g6. This is all theory. Bishop d3, take, queen takes, queen c7, 
which would be two energy of six. Okay, so now we see the pawn structure that we're familiar with, right? So there's an extra h6 and h4 thrown in, but the pawn's on c6 and e6 and the pawn on d4. So here, c4, castle queen side, bishop c3, bishop e6, knight e4, take, take, knight f6, queen c2, side queen e2, rook g8. Um, okay, rook g1. Okay, and now black plays this move c5. So, what benefits does white enjoy after this move? D takes c5. So in terms of dynamic thing it does, it opens up this, it's true. Okay, what else does it do? Either dynamically or statically. So there are two types of advantages, dynamic ones and static ones. Dynamic ones are ones that you know kind of dissipate and static ones are ones that are more permanent. So D file opening, very good. That's a dynamic one. And exactly right, Uncle Vinny, exactly right. So the static one is that there's a queenside pawn majority. So this is very important, actually. Very important. So three versus two now, OK? So, so I'm not sure if you guys are all familiar with the idea of a queenside pawn majority. But basically, if you just take the queenside, which is basically this sector of the board, and you count the pawns, it's three to two. So it's known as a queenside pawn majority. So why is that important? The reason this is important is in endgame, a queenside pawn majority can often be a determining factor between a win and a draw. And the reason is white can often create a pass pawn much more quickly. And therefore force black's king to kind of stay on the queenside. And then White's king would be free to roam to the king side and take the pawns. So, and uh, Christoph, queen side pawn majority, he's talking about that in the middle game. And it is something of a myth in the middle game, but this is an end game, and it's definitely a major thing in an end game. So be sure you specify what you're talking about, because a queen side pawn majority in an end game is almost a, a guaranteed advantage. In the middle game, it's more unclear. But there's a catch-22 for black here because white's pieces are more active currently, right? So in order to kind of alleviate white's initiative, black will seek to exchange pieces, which makes sense. But at the same time, by exchanging pieces, he also magnifies the importance of this queenside pawn majority. And as I mentioned, if it gets to an endgame, Yeah, Zwish, you're right. Uh, and yeah, you think it's less important, but let's let's see what happens and let, let's see how, how it works out. So 95, okay, so black, so you see how white's pieces are kind of assuming threatening roles, right? So black using the common sense aphorism, if your opponent's pieces are more active than yours, seek to exchange them. So he starts to exchange. So rook takes d1, rook takes d1, rook d8, rook takes d8, king takes d8. Okay. So here we're pretty much in an endgame, right? Queens are still on, but with only knight and bishop left, um, it's definitely an endgame phase.
And now, white plays a very nice move. What does white play here? So white needs to find targets, and the target is going to be this guy. So how do we attack that guy? We go g4. So the idea is simple, we just want to go g5, move this knight, win this pawn. Okay. So after g4, knight e8, g5, hg, hg, bishop d6, knight f3, g6. Now b4, bishop b7, king b2, knight d6, c5. Okay, I'm just going to get to a critical position. Okay, so queens are off now. Okay, a5, trying to break up this pawn chain. a3, keeping it. a b, a b. Now black can just kind of sit and wait. So here. Okay. So it looks like, you know, okay, four on four, knight and bishop, knight and bishop. All of, all of white's pawns are in dark. All of black's pawns are in light. So this is technically a bad bishop. This is technically a good bishop. This knight is well posted. It seems like, you know, it should be drawish of anything. I mean, okay, maybe white's king is a little bit better. But what's the real factor here? The real factor here is, can this create a pass pawn easily? No. Can this create a pass pawn easily? Yes. And this all stemmed from the fact that it was a queenside pawn majority. So notice, notice that any, any pawn ending here is a win for white. Because like I mentioned, this pawn will, will lure black's king to the queenside. And then we can either, you know, temporize and force him to push pawns and we can just take them. Or we can just move our king and mow down all the kingside pawns. So with that in mind, white played the excellent move bishop f6. Knowing that if mass exchanges occur in f6, it's a win. So, black didn't want to exchange, so he retreated. But now, uh, white can just infiltrate. So king c4, king d7, b5, king c8, knight d2, king d7, knight f3, bishop b7. Now he's willing to trade. It's too late now. Knight e5, yeah. king e8. Take, take. Knight g4, knight f. Oh, sorry, he took with a king. So knight g4, knight f4, knight f6, king d8. Okay, b6, important little finesse. The idea is you want to play c6. And then king c5, king c6. So, you know, you might think, oh, maybe play c6 first, but b6 is actually stronger. So king b8, b6, e5, knight e4, King d7, knight d6, knight h3, knight e7, knight d5, king d5, and here, black resigned, not much you can do. Again, c6, c7, knight d6, and c8. So, okay, so what do we learn? Queenside pawn majority in an ending equals good. Why didn't he go after the kingside pawns earlier? Uh, how exactly could he have done that? How exactly could he have done that? The problem was he had to keep his pieces kind of back to defend his own pawn. And notice that because white's pawns were all in dark, it was easy for his bishop to defend them. 
Yeah, f2 seems vulnerable, but notice that this bishop can always hop back to defend it, either on g3 or on d4. So the fact that my pawns are all in dark actually means that they're easier to defend, even though it makes my bishop quote-unquote bad. So it would have just basically misplaced one of his minor pieces for no real tangible gain. And it would have made my uh, my gaining of a passed pawn that much easier. And by the time he did it, of course, it was too late, but it would have just made things simpler if, if you go for it earlier. Okay. Yeah, uh, true, but, but the reason why black had to play g6 is because white had superior minor pieces, right? Because otherwise, um, I mean, because otherwise, you know, white was going to play g6 himself, and then there was real threats on black's king. So it was, it was because white's uh, minor pieces were superior that led black to kind of accept this weakening of a structure that led the endgame to be winning. So, you know, but it, it, if, if there was no queenside pawn majority, even though Black's position was compromised, he wouldn't have been able to win, right? Like, imagine this pawn on c4. Well, I can't really circle it, but imagine this pawn on c4 or on e4. Then, even though, even though uh, Black's position, you know, is worse, there's actually no way to break through. Because if White can't create a passed pawn, then suddenly uh, White's pawns become targets. And so... You know, if, if white pushes too hard, he might overextend himself and, and his pawns might start dropping. So the queenside pawn majority was a necessary condition for, um, for white's advantage to increase. But I mean, you're right, it wasn't like the only thing. But, okay, now let's look at... Well, right, but also, like, a queenside pawn majority, like, by itself m probably won't be enough to win unless unless it's a pure pure king and pawn ending. Because as long as there's one minor piece on the board, it's, it's hard unless, again, principle of two weaknesses, right? So, the, but the queenside pawn majority is one weakness by itself. So all I have to do is create one more weakness. You know, usually it's not hard to create one weakness. It's hard to create two, but it's not hard to create one. So you see what I mean? Like, so the fact that the fact that after d takes c5, you created that one weakness means that it's that much easier to create the second one. Because if you just enter an equal endgame, you know, it, it's often the case that you can attack something and, and make them defend it. But the problem is you can't attack a second thing, and so they can defend the one thing that you're attacking, and then you know, there's no more progress to be made. Yeah, so again, the, the positioning of the kings is not really that important. Like, in general, the kings will be cast on the, on the king side, and then the fact that the queen side pawn majority is kind of like an outside pass pawn makes a difference. But notice here that the kings were kind of both in the center, and it didn't matter that much. So the fact is that the queen side pawn majority will usually be a lesser count than the king side pawn majority. Like, queen side pawn majority will usually be three on two or two on one. And the fact that it's a lesser pawn count means it's easier to create a passed pawn. Right, right, right. But it, it's it's twofold. One is it's further away from the king, but two is it's easier to create a passed pawn. So, you know, even if you have... Even if the kings were both on the queen side to start with, as long as I can create my passed pawn before you can create yours, it doesn't matter where the kings are. It just matters that I can create the passed pawn first. It, and it's an added benefit that, in general, both sides are cast on, on the king side, and that the queen side pass pawn is, on, is an outer pass pawn. But the fact that you can actually create the pass pawn first is the more important thing. So, um, so is that clear? Because this is this is like a super important concept in general, not necessarily just in this pawn structure, but. 
again, it, like it, it, it varies from case to case, but that's that's the gist of it at least. So, because if there's something still not clear, I'm I'd be happy to explain it, but. Yeah. Yeah. So the king king position is kind of just like a byproduct of how the kings usually end up developing, but it's not the major factor. Okay. So now let's look at this as a contrast. So this is going to kind of be funny for you guys. Cuz it's going to be the exact same queenside pawn majority. Okay, so again, an early c5. Okay, so of course, notice queen takes d4 loses to bishop takes h7. So, you know, it's not really hanging. Uh, knight bd7, knight f3, queen a5. Bishop d2, knight e5, knight e4. Check. Take, take. Okay, so. This is also a queenside pawn majority, right? This is a, a martial gambit. Um, that early, that quick e4. But it just turned into like a. I mean, it kind of was like a French. It ended up being like some sort of like Rubenstein French. Um. But in general, it's probably not worth sacrificing a pawn for it. Because then you'd have like four versus two on the king side. And that's rough. Yeah, it's not the same thing as a martial gambit in the Roy Lopez. It's a different thing, but yeah. Okay, so white has a queen side pawn majority. We agree, right? So who who is better here? It's okay, Higgs. So who's better here? White is better here. And the reason? <laughs> White is steady mating one. Queen side pot majority. White looks more developed. Okay, so the actual answer is white's worse. And here is the rub. So the so for as much as we were talking about the queenside pawn majority being great in end games, it's actually worse in middle games. And why? And why? Okay. So I know this is a trick for you because it looks like white's better, but the reason is with a kingside pawn majority comes the ability to control the center. Notice, how many center pawns does white have? A big fat zero. So, I gave you some big clues already. That black was better, and that the reason black is better is because he can control the center. So, what should black play here? What should black play here? Very good, f5, exactly, f5, exactly. Okay, so it looks a little weird to kind of make this pawn, you know, kind of backwards from his brethren. It's not technically backwards because there's no pawn on f4 yet, but you know, it looks like this pawn could become weak, right? But you'll see it, it's actually not because, okay, after queen e2, Bishop d6, threatening bishop takes h2, obviously. So, gotta play something. So, h3. And now, 
How does black control the center firmly? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. E5. Right. Okay, and, and now, w without me, you know, having told you who was better before, who would you say is better here? I mean, is there any question in your mind that black would be better here? Because all of a sudden these bishops are running out of squares, these pawns are, are nice, and all of a sudden this bishop's going to come to the game with with some pretty nice effect. Yeah. So the simple fact is that this position almost happened by force from the previous position. But it wasn't it wasn't easy to see. I I will grant you that. But I'll sh I'll show you just a couple more moves just to kind of illustrate. So b4 e4 bishop c2 b6 f3 bishop b7 fe4 and rook a8. And now, look, who's, who's king is safer now? Whites or blacks? Probably blacks, right? And whose pieces are better developed now, whites or blacks? Probably blacks, right? So. Sure, Higgs. <laughs> yeah, I should have done a winner. Well, of course you would make year on the winner. That, that only makes sense. That only makes sense. Okay, so does this make sense to you guys? Yeah, why sells a queenside pawn majority? The problem is he's getting overrun in the center. And if you're getting overrun in the center, that trumps anything that's happening on the queen side. Okay. So now, yeah, so this move f5, so the only reason, let me get rid of these arrows, but the only reason this move f5 is good is because you can get e5 in by force. And with these pawn, pawn duo on e5 and f5, it really just clamps down the center and, and gives black a strong initiative in the center, which is why it's important. Okay, so we looked at, um, black c5 and how d takes c5 can be good because it opens up lines quickly. It opens up this line quickly and this line quickly. And then we saw how d takes c5 can be good because in end games this queenside pawn majority can be a factor. And then we saw how this exchange can actually be bad if, um, if it stays a middle game because black can get some initiative in the center. Okay, so now let's look at a different idea for how to combat c5 and then it'll come from a kind of weird opening but it'll look somewhat familiar in a second check okay so there's no e6 move but It's a very similar structure, still pawn on d4, pawn on c6. Um, okay, so c4, queen c7, bishop b3, knight c7, queen d2. Okay, so here, black sensing that the time was right to kind of break up white's pawn structure, plays the move c5. Okay. And what should white do against this move? Guessing's not discouraged.
Tempted to ignore it. Fair. Okay, so the, part of the reason why black plays c5 is to gain this square for his pieces, right? So for example, if say white ignores it and plays, you know, just a move, like rook d1 or something, right? So after take, take, now all of a sudden uh, I can use the square for my pieces, right? So sometimes it behooves us to remove that square and to also cramp black. And so you guys got the right idea, d5. So it looks maybe a bit anti-positional at first because you're opening up this diagonal. and giving up potentially the e5 square. But it turns out that this pawn actually is doing a lot. So first of all, what, what major target does playing d5 create? For you guys who watch my pawn videos, you should notice this one immediately. Well, you guys should better rewatch the pawn videos, but congrats Onibushu, he's right. So the, the first target it creates is actually this, this pawn. Why? The point is, okay, it's on an open file, and it's now backwards, right? If you push it, I can capture. Exactly. So by playing d5, we created this pawn into a backwards pawn. First point. Okay, second point. Say, say black wanted to play something like e5 or something. What does that make our pawn? Uh, divorcing the fact that we can ampass on it. Yeah. So it makes this pass pawn. Yeah. So. This pawn wouldn't necessarily be so strong if it was easily blockaded, but notice that it's kind of hard to get a piece to this square to blockade it without some other ill effect. So I ideally you'd want a knight to blockade it, but it's, it's kind of hard to get this knight to this square. If the bishop blockades it, then all of a sudden these squares around the king look very weak. And if the queen blockades it, then the queen is, you know, performing a menial task for its power. Queens are usually bad, bad blockaders of pass pawn. So white can kind of play around this pass pawn and, you know, maybe try to go for b4, rook b1, stuff like that. Yeah, queen, if, a queen, if, a queen, if your queen's a fat pawn, exactly, it's not a good thing. Not a good look for black. Okay, so can black play e6 right away? Um, the answer is, of course, no. Because I can play bishop f4 and then take on e6 and then give you uh, uh, isolated pawn on e6. And then if you play e5, then you give me the pass pawn, right? So uh, black chose to play knight b6. But a good question, though. And now all of a sudden, white decides, well, I got all my pieces kind of aimed at the king. Some of those arrows are better than others, but... All those pieces are kind of aimed at the king side. And really, how many defenders does black have? Really only one, right? Yeah. So don't don't call my arrows ace rookie and please. But But to be fair, my pieces are all aimed at the king side. So let's just check me. So bishop h6, queen e6, capture, capture, knight g5, queen c7, rook e4. And all of a sudden rook h4 is coming. So if h6, how does white win? Just a little exercise for you guys. It's a very common idea, but... Okay. 
And I'll answer you guys' questions in a second. So the quickest way to win here is actually knight takes f7. King takes, and queen takes h6, and black's mated here. So this king is not going to find a safe, a safe haven anywhere. Because this pawn's going to be weak when I play rook f4 check. I can always bring my rook to the e1. Queen h7 is always in the air. So this is a, a GG. Okay. So why did white play, or why did black play queen c7? Well, I think he wanted to um, defend this f pawn from the seventh rank. And I think when he played queen d6, he wanted to play queen f6. So I don't think Black realized what was befalling him. So yeah, it, it does look a bit absurd, but he had reasons. And a bishop h8 here, sure, but then, yeah, exactly. But then I can start hopping my pieces into the position. You know, I can play knight g5. Play queen e3 to f3. It's kind of hard to defend f7 now. I also have ideas of like knight takes h7 and queen takes f7 maybe. All sorts of crazy stuff like that. So bishop h8 actually just takes a square away from your king. It doesn't really help your predicament any. Um, yeah, so this d5 pawn is really hemming him in. So uh, let me just show you quickly what ended up happening. Uh, okay, so knight g5. Okay, so after rook e4. Um, so black played bishop d7, and then knight f3, e5, rook e1, f6, rook 4, e3, g5, queen c2. Now notice the light squares are a problem. Rook e7, knight e2, bishop e8. And knight e4. And now notice this knight's coming to f5. And that's the game. So. Okay. Let's look at one more example of this move d5. In these positions and it'll be in the guise of a, of a pawn sacrifice so oftentimes when you play d5 it ends up being a pawn sacrifice but it'll be positionally motivated and I'll show you what I mean So c5 was played. The typical break. And now, this one's not even exactly a true pawn sacrifice, but do you guys see how it's kind of like a, a temporary pawn sacrifice? So after d5, what would black play? So obviously he can't take because the bishop hangs, but what could he do instead? Yeah, knight f6, right. So knight f6 does three things actually. One, it attacks the queen, two, it attacks the pawn, and three, it defends this bishop. Um, 
So after queen c2, ed5. Um, okay, so now what should white play here? So white could, you know, technically win the pawn back immediately by taking on f6 and taking on d5, but that's not really what he had in mind when he played d5. So what should white do? So what's black's positional threat here? Yep, good. So what piece does that move? What piece does that move cut off? The move that Zwish and Yaren suggested. Yep. So how do we how do we uh, fix that? Yeah, very good. So bishop e5 first. So the reason we play bishop e5 is or else d4 would happen. So bishop e5 nicely gains tempo, attacks the queen. OK, so queen retreats. OK, notice, notice now the queen's also forced to be on the same line as the rook. Queen c6 is really no better, right? Because then it'll be on the same line as the bishop. And queen d7, same idea. So bishop b5 is a nice finesse. And if bishop d6, obviously, now I can take on f6 because it ruins the pawn structure. Okay, but bishop b5, queen d8. And now, so what was the point of bishop b5? I mean, it was to get the bishop outside of that potential pawn chain, but what else was it? So now we want to, oops, now we want to make threats. So. I guess I see something strong. Yeah. Knight g5, very good. So knight g5 threatens what? Well, not main one, but threatens to win a piece, basically. Yeah. Threatens to win a piece with bishop takes f6. Because this knight is the only defender of this pawn. And so if we can remove this knight, we can play queen takes pawn mate. So we're threatening bishop takes knight and queen takes pawn mate. Yeah. So uh, black really only has one thing to do, which is to block this diagonal and play g6. OK. And now what does white do here? Take the knight, take the pawn. Careful. 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 Yeah. Very, very good, secret name. Very good. So uh, eventually, we're going to take this guy. I mean, notice that he's pinned this way. He's pinned this way. So he's not going anywhere. He's definitely not going anywhere. But this knight is subject to potential tactics. So h4, just secure this knight. And now after black plays knight h5, now we take back our pawn. 
And notice how overwhelming white's position is, right? So now we have full control over the D file. Our pieces are both better than black's pieces. This knight's, you know, on the rim. This bishop is kind of just sitting there doing nothing. Black's king is weakened. And uh, white wanted a few moves. I'll show you guys the finish just because it's kind of cute. Um, but I mean, white's clearly winning. So queen e8 or key one. Queen c6, bishop e2, rook f8. Now, do you guys see? Do you guys see what white did here? Not rook takes e7. It looks good. But don't forget this knight <clears throat> defends these dark squares. So I can play f6. Doesn't quite work. Doesn't quite work. Yeah, and queen z3 is a little, little too brutish. I can play bishop f6. <laughs> guys are kind of, guys are kind of skirting it. It's tricky though. It's tricky. Knight takes some seven. It's knight takes some seven. It's actually knight takes h7. <clears throat> so the idea is indeed if king takes, rook takes h5. Check. And wins. Like really wins, right? Because of mate. Checkmate. But that's not why this combination is so pretty. Because it's actually not that simple. Because unfortunately for white, black does not have to capture. And so he can actually play this tricky move, bishop takes h4. The idea being uncovering an attack on this rook. And notice that if this rook moves, there's like a rook e1 check and a queen h1 mate. So this rook is actually kind of pinned at the moment. So, you know, for example, I can't like take on e8 and then take on h5 because rook e1 would just mate. So, I'll just give you guys a few seconds. Do you guys see what to do here for white? I mean, you know, even if you do see what to do here for white, the point was he had to see what to do here when he played knight takes h7. Um, you have the right idea, secret noob. You have the right idea. Just the wrong rook. So, simple rook ed1. Just get the rook out of take and still threaten rook takes h5. So queen e6, queen c3 now. Now, all sorts of stuff. And now notice this knight. Notice this knight threatens this. And now notice if king takes knight, of course, rook takes knight check. Check. Removing the defender with check. And then this is mate. Checkmate. So after queen c3, f6 is forced. Queen d3 now. <laughs> Again, threatening rook takes h5 if king takes h7. And also threatening queen takes g6. So queen g4. <laughs> okay. And now, do you guys see the beautiful move to win here? This one's not that hard, but it's pretty. This is like a pure tactic one. This is like a chess tempo problem, basically. So rook takes h5 doesn't quite work because I can take with the pawn, I think, and survive. Because then this pawn's pinned and my bishop's defending this guy on f6. Um, but there's actually something pretty here. And Ray is closer. Right idea. Right idea, wrong piece. Kind of gives it away, but... 
I'll let you guys come up with it for yourselves before I play it on the board. I basically gave it away. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So I'll let you guys ponder that in your minds for a second. So the point is rook g5 and you're creating some nice deflection or actually interference with it. Excuse me. So no matter what takes, you take on g6 and mate is coming. Yeah, interference, exactly. It was the word I was thinking of, it just didn't come to mind immediately. So if, just as a variation, if bishop takes, check. check. Um, so if uh, king h8, just knight takes f6, I guess. Oh. Or no, actually. So, well, knight g7, knight takes f6, and queen takes g4. Um, if king h8, then I guess simplest is just knight takes g5. And then you can take on d1. Check. But now you have no more checks, and it's hard to stop the cavalcade of mates that are appearing upon your head. So it's kind of tricky as well. Um, but black ended up playing queen e4 instead. And then knight takes f6. Check. Knight takes f6. Now g takes h4. Rook e d8. Queen takes d8. Rook takes d8. Rook takes d8. Check. King f7. Bishop takes f6. King takes f6. Rook d6. Check. Check. King f7. Rook d takes g6. Queen takes h4. Rook d7. Check. And white one. So, kind of funny how it simple fight to this position, but anyway, okay, let's do one final thing to think about in terms of tackling the move c5, which is this. So again, typical pawn structure. Black has the c6 and e6 pawns. White has a d4 pawn. Also the c4 pawn. Okay, so black plays knight f6. Bishop c2. Um, so notice that black takes a piece away from the c5 square in order to gain a tempo and help develop, defend his king. c5, of course, was better. Okay, so why is c5 bad now? And <laughs> no, this is not a game I play. So c5 is bad because it's a premature opening of the position. Bishop g5, cd4, queen d4, bishop e7, and queen h4. Very strong. So you're threatening this move. And then this. So h6 would be forced. And then bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes, followed by knight g5, which is winning. So yeah, be careful when you play c5 that you don't open up the position prematurely. And yeah, it doesn't really help black, exactly. Okay, so he didn't play c5, he played h6. Um, okay, so bishop b3, rook e8. Queen d3, queen c7. Okay, so black's finally ready to play c5, right? 
He couldn't play c5 last move, obviously, because two attacks, one defense. But now he has two defenses of c5. So black's already to play c5. What should white do? What should white do? Play c5 first. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, so C5 is actually the right move. So why is C5 good here? Normally it looks a bit anti-positional, right? Because it gives a home for black's pieces on d5. And it kind of removes any sort of forward momentum that these pawns have. So the question is, why is c5 good here? So what factors of this position enable c5 to be correct here? So black's knight can't use d5 because if the black knight moves, queen h7 is mate. That's a that's a point. Well, more importantly, what square do we have an iron grip on right now? Not not so much d6, but what square do we really have an iron grip on? More, more so than d6. <laughs> well, c5, but yeah, e5 is really the key. e5, right. And so because we have a grip on e5, as, uh, as Wish mentioned, the bishop will be out of play. And therefore, the queen on c7 will also be out of play, which means we can consider an attack on the king because we'll have a superior, superiority of forces aimed at the king. So what should white play here? And your answer to that should try to answer the question of what is black's best defender and how can I get rid of it? So, black's best defender is indeed the knight on f6. Very good. So, how to get rid of it? Okay, bishop f4 unfortunately hangs the bishop. So, we don't want to do that. Don't hang pieces. g4. Probably not bad. It's probably not bad. But maybe there, I can, then I can play e5. Maybe, maybe. Nah, probably I can't even play e5. You can just take with a pawn and take on my knight. But yeah. But yeah, you guys got it. Ninety five is stronger. So the idea of ninety five is that we simply want to play knight g four. We don't need to even play f three. Don't forget, knight g four isn't actually hanging a piece. This is one time when you can hang a piece because if he takes queen h seven is mate. So f three is superfluous. But yeah, ninety five is the right move. Yep. Yeah. 
Yep, simply threatening knight g4. It's after knight e5. Uh, <laughs> black went into crazy mode and took on c5. Okay. So why doesn't this work? Looks like it does, maybe. Well, knight g4, don't forget the king can run now. Don't forget the king can run. King f8 is a possibility. King f8, no mate. So careful. Careful. Don't hang all your pieces at once. Because after knight g4, I'm threatening mate now myself. Queen takes h2. Queen takes h2 is checkmate. Um, yeah, so knight takes f7 is okay, but there's something much stronger here. Something much stronger. So again, this is a tactics issue. And the key linchpin is actually the fact that the queen on c7 is undefended. Does that give you guys a clue? Yep. You got it. Bishop takes h6. Right, so bishop takes h6. The point is, if black recaptures, then queen g3 check, and knight check wins the queen. You guys see that one? So bishop takes h6. So if you take, queen g3 check. check. Now if king f8, knight g6 check, and queen takes c7. If king h8, knight g6 check, and queen takes c7. And notice that king h7 is illegal because of the bishop. So he can't take on h6. So he took on d4, trying to complicate matters further. Queen takes d4, g takes h6, queen f4, again threatening queen g3 check, followed by a knight check, also threatening the knight. So knight moves to defend the queen. Queen takes h6. Now notice the queen takes e5. Bishop check. 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 Mate. check. mate. So, can't take on e5. So, tries f6 to try to defend along the 7th rank. And now, f4, rook e7, knight g6, and here black resigns. Because if for g7, queen check. h8, and queen f8, check mate. And if for g7, then queen f8, check mate. Okay, so that's it for this one. So we saw some potential responses by white to. Black c5 pawn break and how they can both be good for him and bad for him. So next time we'll take a look at Black's potential other pawn break which is e5 and also look at that pawn break in more of a, a Slav pawn strategy.